All right, so with that, I have the pleasure to introduce Jonah Sachs. Jonah is the man behind, if you guys have seen popular shorts like The Story of Stuff, uh, The Matrix, um, Star Wars. Uh, he's got a whole myriad of them. He, this is one of the revolutionary game changers right here. Uh, Jonah has written a book called Winning the Story Wars, all about how we use stories to convey our deepest values uh, to others around us. I love his book. I love his stuff. I've been a fan for a long time. We're working on ways to work with him more at the Savior Institute. So it's my pleasure to introduce Jonah Sachs. Thank you. So uh, when you do a lot of public speaking like I do, you eventually get over the anxiety of doing it, but you still have nightmares for some reason before it happens. And I'm pretty sure one of my nightmares is that the guy who went before me uh, had a charming English accent, a beautiful voice, and plays guitar. Uh, so I'm just trying to breathe and, and let it go. But, but so as much as you know, Tim set me up, he also set me up in a great way because I couldn't agree more that this is a movement that we're all part of here. And we need to think of it as a movement. And just as we need to invest in the products that come out of it, in the science that goes, that goes into it, in the relationships that hold it together, we also need to invest in the larger story that the movement tells. Because there is no such thing as a movement that's been successful without a great and powerful story behind it. And I want to talk to you guys a little bit about what I've learned over 10 years of studying stories and movements and give you some things that you can take away. And my hope is that this will inspire you over the next few days and over the next few years to inquire with each other, what is this story that we're telling together and how do we construct it? And I want to give you some, some tools for doing that today. But I'll start by saying that my strange journey into storytelling actually began with my own personal fight against industrial agriculture and this movie, The Matrix. Um, thank you. If you haven't seen it, um, it's old but worth watching. Uh, you can look at it at thematrix.com or on YouTube. And uh, so here's what happened. Um, I was a graphic designer. I was playing around with how this new internet thing could get people to share, think, share ideas that they are most passionate about and how perhaps uh, you know, marketers who didn't have the millions of dollars and weren't selling the sneakers um, could get people to share what they cared about. And um, I was playing around with ideas and me and my partner in crime wanted to do a project that was a passion project. And we said, what's really wrong with this world? And one of the things that we thought brought everything together that was wrong was industrial agriculture. So we're like, well, how do we make this interesting? Because just it's not interesting to most people. And Little by little, we stumbled on the idea that industrial agriculture is a lot like the Matrix. Because the Matrix is something that's so horrible that people can't even look at it. And we kind of create this fantasy of what it is, just like we create this fantasy of what farming is, right? You buy that pack of hot dogs and there's this beautiful bucolic farm on it. Well, there's no farm out there, right? There's just a factory. Um, and so when we have something in society that's so wrong we can't even look at it, we make this fantasy world, just like the Matrix. And what if we could get people to take that red pill and think differently, right? So we, on a little bit of intuition and the fact that the Matrix sounds like the Matrix and Mufius was funny for Morpheus and all this kind of stuff, we made this very silly movie and launched it. And we wound up getting 45 million people to pass it around. And that was cool. And unlike, you know, what would come later of cat videos and all that kind of stuff and make people laugh but don't do anything, this changed the way people thought and ate and all that kind of stuff. And so I was like, this is great. You can do this kind of stuff. You can change the world through viral videos. And then I realized that, you know, this success was not easy to repeat. It, yeah, I put out some movies that were awful after this. You know, I, put, I had some successes, I had some failures, and I had to ask myself, well, why did this movie get 10 people to watch it, and this movie got 40 million people to watch it? Um, and I couldn't accept that it was just that I had made some funny puns and some silly characters. So I started studying what makes great storytelling for movements. So I could basically repeat my own successes and, and be, be smarter as a communicator. And here's what I learned, and I think there's a lot of lessons in what I learned that we can use as a community to spread uh, the story of holistic land management and sustainable agriculture. So first I began by learning about stories themselves. What, what is a story? How do we understand stories? A lot of people will talk about storytelling but rarely define it. So we'll begin by talking about the fact that a story is a set of characters. 
It's a conflict between them. It's the setting they inhabit. It's all that stuff that we can see if we just watch or listen to a story. But those pieces are all aligned for a very clear reason, to illustrate a core truth about how the world works, a moral of the story. A storyteller does not just place these things by happenstance because they think it might be fun or funny or interesting. They place these things because it's a way of sharing how the world works. And it's why my five-year-old son sits on my lap and says, Dad, tell me a story every single night. He wants to know how I think the world works. And I want to tell him how I think the world works. And instead of just lecturing him, I tell him stories about what happens to people who are greedy, who are mean to their sister, etc. And, <laughs> and he listens and he learns, right? And now when I tell him that story, there's something a level deeper that I'm sharing with him, which is my values. And this is why tribes are held together by stories. And anthropologists say all tribes tell stories to hold them together, because it's how I share our core values. If I tell you a story and the moral is, he who hesitates is lost, popular moral, many stories, you know that I value risk and adventure, and I want you to value that too. If I tell you a story and the moral is better safe than sorry, you know that I value safety, predictability. I want you to value that too. Stories replicate values. They send them out into the world. And so if we want to replicate our values, we need to learn to tell really great stories and not just lecture people. And so when we think about a movement and all the ways that it communicates, we can think about every tool that we have out there in the world as different parts of that visible element of the story. Those are the characters. But are they aligned about, around a core truth that we all share, a, a dream that we all share together? And do we know what values we can, we're leveraging in the people we want to move? We need to start thinking about everything that we say and we do as part of this movement, as part of this larger strategic story, and recognize that a movement is a story unfolding across all touch points. Gone are those days where you could just make a billboard and suddenly everyone, you're broadcasting to everyone, or a 30 second spot. Everyone in the world is able to participate, but you can set the tone of the story by understanding, well, what is that truth we all stand for and what are the values? But stories are even more important in, in changing people's lives, I discovered, than just getting them to share values. As I went further and deeper into my research, I discovered this idea of myths. Right? That people live by myths, and we usually think of the idea of a myth as a, as a lie. But really myths, as anthrop anthropologists understand them, are these core meaning stories. They bring together four things. So we can use the uh, myth of Genesis, not saying it's not true, not saying it is true. I'm saying this is something that many people have built their lives around and do what all societies have done with their myths. It gives us an explanation. God created the world in six days and then rested. It gives us a meaning. It's God's world, so we should live by his rules. It tells us who we are. It's a story. It doesn't necessarily take place in our neighbor's backyard yesterday. It takes place long ago and far away. So long ago and far away, we can never go back to the Garden of Eden. And then rituals. Are there ways to live this story out in our own lives? Yeah, of course. There are hundreds or maybe thousands of ways in the Bible to live by this story. And then last century, a lot of people said that our global scientific society was becoming the first society not to have myths. And Carl Jung even said that some of the World War stuff that we were seeing was really because we didn't share core meaning stories anymore. We were going to be the first society without myths. And many people believe that we still are, but I don't. I think that what's happened is that marketers have come along and become our myth makers. They've taken over the role of telling our stories and uh, not always for the best. So this is the most famous pitch man in history. This is the Marlboro Man. Um, he never uttered a single word, and yet we all remember him and know him. Um, he's a cowboy. He uh, gives us all the things that myths give us, right? He gives us explanation. So this Marlboro Man came out when Philip Morris was launching a new cigarette. It was a filtered cigarette, and it was a filtered cigarette for men. You've got to understand, before the cigarette came out, no guy would be caught dead with a filtered cigarette. I'm trying to think of what a good analogy is, but I'm just going to skip over that. But it's just not a cool thing for a guy to smoke a filtered cigarette. But instead of, instead of Philip Morris doing what most social change marketers just tend to do, which is yell about the facts and the figures and all the great things about this new cigarette or all the problems in the world, they simply showed a man smoking this filtered cigarette. It's a new explanation of how the world works. Men folks smoke filtered cigarettes now. Meaning. Does this give people identity? Of course. If someone pulls out a pack of Marlboro Reds to this day, we know that this person has a certain kind of identity. It's not a product. It's a way of being. It's an attitude. Story. Did they just rely on real people 
t telling exactly what's happening in the world? Of course not. People didn't see this billboard and say, hey, that guy's not real. He's an actor. We know that. That's fine. We like to think in symbols. This guy changed the way people saw themselves. And then ritual. Can you live this story out in your own life? Well, of course you can. You can just go to the store and buy a different pack of cigarettes. What this type of marketing did, story-based marketing, it got people to identify with the products that they buy. It turned our society, actually, from a thrift-based society, a Puritan work ethic society, a society that was like the less you use, the less you spend, the better you are, into a society where we define ourselves by our products and what we buy. We created change on Madison Avenue in a single generation, changed the life ways of the world through the stories that we told through marketing. And that's a little bit depressing, but that's also good news, because it only took a generation to change the mindsets of the world through this type of story-based marketing. And we can change that in a generation too, maybe even faster, because we have much better tools than we used to. But we need to learn, in some ways, to emulate this kind of myth-making, but also to watch out, because the world has changed, and this no longer works in the same way anymore. What do I mean by that? Well, this is a kind of typical storytelling approach that they used when people who were getting the media were consumers of the media. They sat on their couches or they opened up their magazines and they just took the media in. They didn't get to decide what they shared or what they had. So they used this very simple approach. I call it inadequacy marketing. There's a damsel in distress. That's you, the consumer. There is a hero. That's the brand with the solution come to save the day. And then there's villain, which is a scary world where everyone thinks you basically suck. And if you don't use this product, you're going to fall apart, right? So what does that look like? Well, here's one of the most famous versions of this uh, from the 1920s. Um, this is sad Edna. Uh, she's 27, and she's not married. So that's a spinster, it turns out. Um, and why is she not married? Because you know, some version of the fact that she sucks. She has bad breath. And she will never be married because she has a problem that she doesn't even know about. And can she be saved? Yes. A product is going to come along to save her. That's Listerine. So this created out of a product, nobody, the inventor of Listerine did not even know what it was for. It was a uh, pharmaceutical antiseptic. Uh, they made a whole beauty industry out of it, sold billions of dollars worth of this product by making people feel really bad about themselves. Um, I just want to ask for a second, though. Could you imagine when you're on your social media uh, whatever you use, or you're talking to friends uh, through the new tools that we use, could you imagine blasting this out to all your friends, telling everyone that they have bad breath and better by Listerine? Of course not. People don't share this kind of stuff anymore. When they're passive consumers of media, this is what they take in. We've been told for so long that to be a good citizen is to be a good consumer by this type of marketing. But the good news is this type of marketing no longer works. Even Madison Avenue ca is catching on to that. We have a new kind of society coming up where everyone gets to decide what stories they share and what they tell and what's important and what's not. And what happens when people get to decide what type of stories they share? Well, somebody out there was able to answer this question, at least in my mind, um, and this is Joseph Campbell. So Joseph Campbell, um, who some of you may know, uh, got really famous because he asked the same question and answered it. He said, when people get to share certain kinds of stories, what kind of stories do they tend to share? He studied cultures across time and across space. And what he came up with was this common pattern that everybody seems to like, which is called the hero's journey. And the hero's journey, um, he wrote about it in scholarly articles. He wrote about it in popular books and on TV. He even helped George Lucas write Star Wars um, on the hero's journey model. In fact, The Matrix, that film that I stole and spoofed, was written point by point on Campbell's hero's journey. And this is a great tool when we're trying to market a movement. I've used it time and time again with great success. And this is where I think some of the practical stuff's going to start coming in. So let me tell you what the hero's journey is all about. You've got this helpless outsider. So this could be like um, a teenager with not a lot of power, maybe who lost her mother and now a wicked stepmother's come onto the scene. Or maybe it's a hobbit who's only three feet tall. Um, in the story of, of Moses, uh, this is, in the Bible, uh, this is an old man. Moses was 80 years old and stuttered, was afraid to speak to anybody, uh, was quietly tending sheep when God came to him and told him to return and free the slaves in Egypt. Um, so you've got this outsider who's muddling through a world that's imperfect. They have these deeply held values, but they don't know how to live them out day to day. And then one day, they meet a mentor. 
So this mentor could be like Obi-Wan Kenobi, uh, the fairy godmother, God in the story of Moses, who says, so much more is possible. You have a great destiny. And the hero says, who, me? Of course I don't. I'm just a normal person. And then the mentor says, no, really, you can fix this world that, that seems so damaged. And the hero says, well, how can I do that? And, they, and the mentor says, well, it's really, really hard, first of all. In, in, the, in the story of Moses, God says, you're going to get killed because I'm going to harden Pharaoh's heart. He's not going to listen to you, and he's going to kill you. So it's not a very appealing journey at first. But, um, but also, I will give you some kind of magical gift. I'm going to give you something that's going to make you just a little bit stronger. And the hero's like, well, this is great. Let's go do something like this. And the mentor says, no, actually, I, I can't come with you. You've got to go do it by yourself. I'm not, I'm not the hero of this story. Obi-Wan Kenobi lets himself be killed by Darth Vader uh, before Luke has to go blow up the Death Star. So then the hero goes, you know, they learn lessons along the way. They find the source of the world's brokenness, and they steal this treasure. And this treasure, incidentally, the way that I've drawn it here, looks like a bottle of Listerine, but it's, it's not meant to be... Because the treasure is not something that makes the hero more beautiful or richer, or get more convenience in their life. The treasure is something the hero brings back to heal the world. And Campbell says that we love to hear stories about ordinary people healing the world because it makes us believe we can be a hero in our own lives. And in fact, if you're into this kind of evolutionary biology stuff, it's possible that tribes that told this to their young people were tribes that held together better because people listened to those stories and said, yeah, I want to do something to grow up. It's a rite of passage to listen to this story. And the tribes that told and shared those stories were the ones that did better and passed on their genes. So when we talk to people and tell them stories, this is the kind of story they want to hear. Hollywood makes billions of dollars telling this story. And we can tell this story, too, with a social movement. But it means we need to communicate in ways that we don't always uh, intuitively think of. So our story of this movement um, can be thought of as a hero's journey. And how will that happen? So first of all, let's think about the hero. When we talk and share ideas, um, we tend to think, well, we've got a story to tell you, and it's about this great solution that we have. We have this story to tell you, and we are the heroes of the story. The communicator is the hero. But the hero's journey teaches us, actually, that the heroes of the stories of the movements that matter are not about the leaders of the movement. It's not about the people in the know. The great stories are really about ordinary people Making, ordinary change, making extraordinary change. So as we think about the stories we tell about this movement, let's not talk about how brilliant we are, how brilliant this model is, maybe not even how Alan Savory is the hero of this movement, but as how ordinary people making decisions on the land every day in their shopping choices are actually contributing to profound change and how those things are actually heroic. And when you think about it, think about the difference. Oh, well, thank you. Um, and when you think about it, think about the difference between ina inadequacy marketing, which tells people, you have nothing, you're weak, you're pathetic, and we have the magical solution, so come give us money. And I can tell you, that's not just antiseptic product makers, mouthwash makers who do that kind of thing. That's a lot of environmental uh, organizations as well, saying the world is falling apart. We're the only ones who can do something about it. Give us some money. Um, that doesn't create the kind of spirited citizen that's actually going to go out and change the world. It just doesn't. And it doesn't create the kind of social sharing that we need to build movements and get that kind of pickup that we need, uh, like I saw with the Matrix. At the end of the Matrix, Mufius holds out the red pill to the viewer, and it says it's you who has the power to break the, to break the Matrix. And that's the end of the film, and that's why I think a lot of the reason people shared it. So lesson one, when you're communicating about this, make your listener the hero. Make the farmers and the ranchers the hero. Um, make the consumers or the customers the hero. And let's not make this movement the hero. But what are we? We're really like the mentors. We're the Obi-Wan Kenobis of this movement um, who are helping people find a better way. And our job is not to tell them how unsafe or uncool they are if they don't participate. Our job is to tell them how great they can be through a relationship with this movement. And so um, in the old days of broadcast marketing, the voice um, that we usually heard was the voice of God, right? So as in our communications, we would yell out from the radio, like, there's never been a better time to buy a Cadillac. Come in today. And people didn't say, 
who is that person telling me, yelling at me? It was just sort of like God. It was like God because the people who could buy time on the radio were way richer and smarter than we were. And so we're just like, I don't know that guy, but I'm going to listen to him. And, um, but the interesting thing, and the interesting thing about this is that Campbell talked about how much the relationship between the hero and the mentor really mattered in these stories. If you think about these stories, and I'm sure you've got your own examples of them, it was about Gandalf and Frodo and their friendship. It was about humans connecting to other human beings. In fact, in the story of Moses in the Bible, one of the things that happens is God is the mentor, Moses is the hero, and God comes to Moses in the form of a burning bush and says, okay, you've got to go free the slaves. And Moses doesn't say, okay, I'll go rush out. There's never been a better time to go free the slaves. He goes, he goes who are you? And basically, what's your name? And so God says, I am that I am. And Moses is like, uh, okay, that's not that helpful. And then, but it's poetic. And then God comes out of the burning bush and sits with Moses for five days on the mountaintop before they just, Moses decides to go on this crazy adventure. And so what we can learn from this is that if we want to engage people, we have to engage them with this movement in a very human voice. We have to expose our own humanity, tell our own stories. Don't just hit them with the facts and the infographics and the, you know, all the different pictures of what can happen in the land. Let's really share our own personal stories and speak in that, in that um, very human voice, making change appealing. Um, not threatening them with what will happen if change doesn't happen. So we really want to talk about how we access that inner Yoda. And I have to say that my daughter loves to uh, speak in Yoda speak because this is memorable and exciting and gives like a, a real brand to the whole thing. So how do we find that unique and human voice is one of the things we work on with our clients a lot. If our movement was a, was a human being, what human being would they be? Obviously, if Marlboro Cigarette was a human being, they decided who that was. It was the Marlboro Man. It really worked. Okay, so that's the second lesson. Now, the, the, the third lesson has to do with values. And I'm going to show you some, some marketing, some, some product marketing to, to illustrate this point, even though I know you guys are not all a bunch of product marketers. Um, but let's look for a moment at how values work. There's an interesting story about this. Um, my timer has stopped. Can I just find out how much more time? Uh, it's, yeah. it's, how much more time do I have? Okay, I'll just, I'll, I, gotta, I will not take too long. All right, so anyway, I just realized, just frozen. Another one of those nightmares, right? You're sitting and you're giving a talk and suddenly you realize you've been talking for 35, 50 minutes. And no, all right, I have 10 more minutes, great. <laughs> uh, <laughs> nightmare just ended. Okay, so, um, you know, here is some typical broadcast marketing. And I want you to know that broadcast marketing, really interesting story, was first developed by this guy named Edward Bernays. He was Freud's nephew, and he was the king of Madison Avenues in, in the 20s and 30s. He really was. Like, he invented the term PR. He invented the first product placement. He invented uh, the first political campaign advertising. And he was literally Freud's nephew. He um, introduced Freud in America, and he believed in his uncle's ideas about humanity, which was basically that people are only motivated by things like fear and greed and need for safety, uh, affordability, money. He, Freud had lived through some horrible stuff in Europe and felt that human beings were essentially dark creatures. And so he developed the early um, assumption was that we do need to motivate people by their values, but people's values are always low. And so we see a typical kind of broadcast ad like this um, in which uh, we have something interesting going on. We have this woman who's just washed with soap and she's actually filthy. And then we have this other woman who's really doing great because she washed with Dove, and we're supposed to feel frightened and like we won't fit in if we don't use Dove. And I think this is great because it says artistic dramatization at the bottom, so we also have to be stupid to believe it because soap doesn't actually make us dirty. <laughs> now, like, I can tell you that this obviously was not a viral hit for Dove. Um, no one would, ha would look at this unless they really had to. I guess some people might have bought the product. Um, but this Freudian view of how we motivate people is actually limited and, I think, wrong. Um, Freud was followed by this guy, Maslow, who many of you may have heard of as well. And Maslow had this interesting idea. He said, OK, Freud, you studied people to figure out what made them tick. And everyone that you studied um, was one of your patients, so they were mentally ill. So everybody who came to you was really unhappy and then so you say that people are basically really unhappy but what if we study people who are doing really well in their lives what do we find and he came up with this new idea which is Maslow's hierarchy of needs that says yes we do need to 
um, meet our physiological needs. We need to food and water. We need to be safe. We need to fit in. All those things that the old marketing is about. But um, we also all are human beings that are reaching for something higher. We want to be part of community. We want to seek truth and justice. Uh, I think something that probably the uh, artisans of the grassland, the artisans out there who are actually working the land, really believe in this perfection value that Maslow talked about, which is a value of we actually want to work hard to get really good at our crafts, not just take the easy way all the time. He picked out these nine values and um, said that this is what really makes our spirits soar. And so when Dove found that the old marketing wasn't working, they changed to something else. They made this Real Beauty Sketches ad, which was the most successful ad in YouTube history. Got about 150 million views in the first couple of weeks. And I can tell you that that was a lot more than that ridiculous uh, dirty soap ad. And the idea was that they were telling women that the beauty myth is a lie. And they set up this elaborate kind of uh, documentary in which women come in and talk to a uh, sketch artist, explain their, how they look to a sketch artist, and he draws them. And they don't look very good because people, don't, women don't see themselves as very beautiful because of what the media does. And then they have a stranger describe them and they come out looking so much more beautiful. And when the women see this discrepancy, they re, the, the red pill is taken. They realize what the media has been doing to them. And of course, everyone wants to share this kind of thing. A soap product with nothing to offer the world became a social movement. So imagine what we can do if we get savvy about how we tell our story when we have so much an actual solution to offer. Um, but let's think about those higher values. Let's really have that kind of respect for our audience and, our, and, our, and people who want to join the movement. So we need to be a vehicle for values. And we need to think about what are those values that we really do share with the people we want to bring into this movement and how can they be those soaring higher level values. So I have one more lesson for you which is really about the moral of the story. So we need to bring all of this together into a core compelling truth that everyone can share. And, and I think that, that the work, Tim, that you've begun with this dream maybe can really be boiled down to what is that truth about the relationship between people and animals and plants and the future of this planet that someone could say, that's my truth too. Yes, I want to be a part of that. That is my truth too. And the best communicators out there um, are willing and able to do that. They're really able to take that time to boil it down. So that what, is this, what do I stand for? What is the moral of my story? So we worked with Greenpeace um, to change their global brand. And one of the things that Greenpeace was doing was saying basically, uh, we are a bunch of heroes and we can save the world. And in private they were saying, whoa, 35 people, 100 people can never save the world. That's all the employees we have. So why are we talking this way? And um, we help them change the moral of the story to be that everything that they do needs to spark courage in other people. They want to be about courage, that core value, and that only billions of acts of courage can change the world. You know, Nike has this everything you need is already inside moral. That's what made them such a uh, transcendent marketer when every other product says, hey, we'll make this easy for you. Nike said, no, we can't make anything for you. But what, what you need is already inside, and that's what, incidentally, was the... Um, was was Star Wars' uh, moral of the story, too. Uh, I know this, uh, this movement has a troubled uh, chapter with Patagonia, but they obviously do create this tribe as well around this idea that life is most enjoyable when you do the least harm. And I've talked to all their marketers and all the heads of these, these companies, and they say, once we align around what we really believe, and, and, our, and our audiences believe it, too, because it's so simple, the world starts to change. Even Airbnb, uh, who was making more money than they knew what to do with, when they rebranded, they said, we can't just be about making money. We need to be about something more. And they, they, they specifically said they wanted to become a movement, a movement about the belief that people can be trusted and are good. So if we can get together and figure out what really matters to us, what is that mantra that we all stand for, we can start building a movement. And what happens when you invest in a new story, when you really take that time to step back and get out of the facts and the features of what's going on on the ground and the day-to-day, -day, uh, you can make those kinds of breakthroughs. I followed and been part of some of the great stories that have been uh, unfolding in our society, and I can see how overnight that combination of anger and a larger dream and core truths sometimes coalesce and capture the imagination of the world, and it can happen in an instant. You know, we've seen this with Black Lives Matter, which was certainly a combination of anger and dream and storytelling.
We've seen it what's happened in incredibly a short amount of time. I don't know if you can see this image. It's a really great storytelling image uh, from the cover of the New Yorker. But we've seen it in the way that we look at same-sex marriage has changed so quickly because of great storytelling. Here's Ernie and Bert cuddled up on the couch watching the Supreme Court decision. Um, but that movement intentionally invested in his story and changed completely the way the world sees that issue because it created a very compelling and lovely story. Um, we're seeing the way that uh, the war on drugs is finally being changed uh, and, and turned around by some very um, intentional communications and campaigns uh, based on values that go well beyond the choir. So I'll leave you with this idea that while moving beyond the choir and getting our story out there is a long and arduous process, it can be very difficult. If we think about a few key ideas, and I've seen this work for so many clients and movements, um, if we can really identify the hero of our story as those people that we want to move to action, and instead of lecturing them and yelling at them and saying, why don't you understand, we show them how much better they can be in their lives at affecting the world uh, through relationship with us. If we can take on that unique Yoda voice of the mentor, be true as human beings and not broadcasting uh, as if from behind the, the visibility of a radio. If we can offer some kind of magic gift, which I think this movement does, uh, that makes it seem possible. We're all tired of hearing that the world is going to change and there's a solution out there. This is a tangible solution. Show them how this solution really works. Align around a core truth, a moral of the story, and share values that matter, not just to us, but to our audiences. If we can start sketching out these pieces uh, and sharing them and talking about them, um, in whatever way we can, either through you know, literally using this chart or uh, just starting to have discussions about what do you value? What do the people you sell to value? What do we stand for as a, as a community? I can tell you that that time spent will pay off in spades uh, and the true movement can emerge and uh, it'll go from just a core group of the choir to you guys arming the larger choir and making a larger choir beyond that. Um, if you're interested in reading about my journey and what I've learned, um, this is by my book, Winning the Story Wars. And, um, oh, I just totally forgot how I wanted to end. I'll end with thank you very much. <laughs>